The Generation Starship is a huge, rather slow spacecraft that is also known as the Interstellar Arc. It is its own kind of alternative to spaceships that fly at much higher speeds and have traditional crews. But just how realistic is this? And will the time come when mankind will accomplish these kinds of voyages in real life? This is a really interesting question that people asked back in the old days. Taking all these factors into account, according to researchers' most conservative and modest estimates, the group of colonizers should initially consist of 98 people. Besides, each of the 49 married couples should, to begin with, be selected by DNA analysis in order to ensure maximum genetic diversity. If a smaller crew were to set out on the voyage, the success of the mission would already be in question. For example, the chances of survival for 25 married couples is already estimated at about 50%. And if there are only 32 or even fewer settlers, the odds leave them no chance at all, 0%. Perhaps the descendants of the original crew will reach Proxima Centauri, but by that time they will no longer be able to establish a sustainable colony. But this poses the question, but what if we use cryonics or suspended animation? This is a type of hibernation that can be beneficial in helping the travelers to conserve emotional resources and avoid burnout. It is possible, but not for long. In fact, for much shorter than we think, since this sort of hibernation carries risks, even if people go into it for several months and not years. The consequences may not be reversible, and from what was a strong team, all that will remain will be exhausted and depressed travelers. Therefore, we're back to the old scenario. So having left the Earth behind, the 98 space travelers will give birth to children and they to grandchildren, even during the lifetime of the first generation. So judging by the calculations, the maximum population on the Ark could reach 500 people. And this means that the colonists will have to provide themselves with food on their own. In other words, grow it directly on board the ship. But how much food do they need? After all, the size of the ship depends on this and therefore the energy required to move it. These calculations require taking not only the size of the crew into account, but also the average age of the spaceship's inhabitants, their height, weight, and level of physical activity. In order to understand how many calories they will each need annually. If the ship is constructed in the form of a rotating cylinder so that the centrifugal force provides artificial gravity, then the height of the agricultural compartment should be 320 meters with a radius of 224 meters. Add to this the crew's quarters, the common areas such as a dining room, a gym or a medical unit, the flight control rooms, the power generators and the engines, and the size of the spaceship will approximately double in size. The space arc will be approximately 650 meters long and 450 meters in diameter. As you can see, we had to disregard some things and violate a lot of others. Interstellar journeys are still a fantasy for us. But what kind of fantasy doesn't become reality? after a while.
You've probably heard statements like these. The pilot is experiencing a force of seven Gs or gravitational forces, or the acceleration force was nine Gs, or perhaps even more. Indeed, you yourself regularly experience stressful forces in everyday life. Well, that is not only emotional, but also physical. How do G forces affect a person on Earth? How are they felt in space? and even at faster than light speeds? Let's try to answer these questions. To begin with, as always, you should understand what G-forces are and how they occur. From the definition, it follows that a G-force is the ratio of the absolute value of linear acceleration caused by non-gravitational forces to the standard acceleration of free fall at the surface of the Earth. Being the ratio of two accelerations, g-force is a dimensionless value, but is often stated in units of the standard acceleration of free fall, g or gravity, which is 9.8 tenth of a meter per second squared. This represents how many times greater the force of inertia is in relation to the usual force of gravity acting upon a body under conditions of the Earth at sea level. And the more abrupt the maneuver, the stronger the g-force. The fact is, the human body is able to tolerate accelerations of higher than 9 g's for brief durations, but very few are capable of enduring them for more protracted periods of time. If it's only for brief moments, we humans can handle much higher g-forces without suffering serious injury. The record for enduring momentarily high g-forces belongs to Eli Beating, who rode backwards on a special rocket-powered sled in 1958 and literally took a force of 82.6 g's in the chest when the sled accelerated to 55 km per hour in one-tenth of a second. Beating lost consciousness, but got away with only small bruises on his back, demonstrating the incredible capabilities of the body. John Ivanovich Gridunov, an equipment tester for the Soviet space program, was also involved in numerous experiments that verified the limits of the human body. They even called him the ground-based astronaut. While testing a pressure suit, he underwent a number of experiments in a high-altitude pressure chamber, including uncontrolled decompression. During a simulated emergency landing, he experienced an impact force of 50 Gs as well as having withstood a force of 19 Gs in the region of thoracic spine on a centrifuge. Even the Orion spacecraft won't be able to deliver our full velocity potential. But let's glance into the distant future, when spaceships will be able to travel extremely fast, thousands of times faster than with today's technology. Let's remember that light travels at a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. Consequently, if we assume that we will be able to overcome known technological limitations and build hyperspeed spacecraft, our delicate bodies, made mostly of water, will have to contend with the new risks that will result from such high-speed travel. If humans do acquire the ability to travel faster than light, the potential dangers that may be encountered are the discovery of a mind-boggling paradigm or the detection of wormholes in the current physical state. Even if we begin speeding up to 40,000 km per hour, the acceleration should be gradual. After all, it is specifically acceleration that affects the magnitude of the g-force. Hypothetically, you can speed a ship with a person aboard up to the speed of light. Let's just try to ignore the laws of physics here and make believe. But the question is not with the terminal velocity or final speed, but in how quickly it gathers that speed. 
If in a year our passenger remains safe at a speed of one kilometer per second, even with a moderate increase in acceleration, that person won't have enough of his average life expectancy left to do it. If by chance he did achieve such a speed, contrary to all the laws of physics, he should feel no worse than he would being in an airplane. Having said that, if the acceleration from zero to speed of light took just a second, well, that'd be better not to imagine. Rapid acceleration and deceleration can be fatal for a human. More than 40 years ago, the Voyager space probe, exploring the vicinity of Jupiter, took the first photographs of the bright yellow surface of one of the moons of the giant planet Io, the most volcanically active world in the solar system, with hundreds of volcanoes, some of which erupt lava fountains up to 200 kilometers high and higher. Even then, it was clear that this was an extraordinary, ever-changing world. Besides, it was the Voyager that, for the first time, managed to document Jupiter's radiation belt which passes right across the line of Io's orbit. It is entirely because of such unfortunate positioning that the level of radiation from the giant planet on its nearest satellite is 1,000 times stronger than the level of radiation on the Earth's surface, which makes finding a person on Io simply impossible. Or possible, but not for long. And ill. Thanks to the data collected by spacecraft, such as Voyager 1 and 2, Galileo and New Horizons, we have learned a great deal. But at this very moment, the Juno spacecraft is there, and its data has tremendously expanded our understanding of this hellish place. In fact, Io is slightly larger than our Earth's moon, a mere 5%, and orbits at a distance of just over 400,000 kilometers from Jupiter. This satellite is always pointed at one in the same side of its planet making a complete revolution around it in 42.5 hours. But the most unusual and exciting thing that the Juno probe registered on the moon of Io was its surface. The tremendous quantity of heat inside the moon, which keeps most of its subsurface crust in liquid form, seeks any accessible outlet to the surface in order to relieve the pressure. As such, Io's surface is constantly regenerating itself filling any impact craters with lakes of molten lava. It is assumed that the composition of this material is predominantly molten sulfur, its compounds and silicate rock, which better accounts for an apparent temperature which may be too high. Sulfur dioxide, incidentally, is the primary component of the satellite's atmosphere. Although it is so extremely thin and low in density that, in fact, it is more correctly referred to as an exosphere, which is filled with volcanic gases. The volcanic atmospheric discharges do not contain water and water steam. Thus, being without water, Io significantly differs from the other satellites of Jupiter, the colder Galilean moons. Io's colorful and bright surface appearance is the result of the rigorous work of the volcanoes, which emit various substances in the form of sulfur, dioxide, and silicates. A frosting of sulfur dioxide coats much of the moon's surface, coloring its regions white or gray. In many of the regions, sulfur is also visible due to its yellow and yellow-green color. At mid and high latitudes, radiation is usually broken down by the stable, octatomic cyclic molecules of sulfur, as a result of which, Io's polar regions are colored in a reddish-brown tint. There are no less than 400 formidable volcanoes on Io, and moreover, about 150 can be active at the same time, generating veritable chaos on the surface. Flows of basaltic lava are a common sight in this place. Magma bursts forth onto the surface through inclines on the bottom of pateras, which are formations with a flat bottom and steep walls, or through the cracks in the flat bottoms creating numerous wide lava flows. During exceptionally large eruptions, such lava flows can stretch for hundreds of kilometers. As a result of volcanic activity, sulfur dioxide in the form of gas and silicate matter in the form of ash 
rise to a height of up to 200 kilometers into outer space in the form of a kind of radiation umbrella. And after falling, they color the region red, black, and white. One of the largest volcanic depressions on Io is Loki Patera. With a diameter of 250 kilometers, it is partially filled with molten lava and covered with a hardened thin crust. Similar lakes are directly connected with the magma reservoir located below them. And since the solidified lava is denser than the molten lava below, this crust can sink, increasing the thermal emissions of the volcano. During an eruption, the wave from the sinking crust spreads across the Patera at a rate of about 1 kilometer in 12 hours, until the entire lake is again crusted over. Besides volcanoes, there are also mountains on Io that were formed due to the collisions of layers of the lithosphere, the satellite's hard crust. In those places where stone slabs press heavily against each other, massive cliffs have risen from the depths in exactly the same way that mountains appeared on our Earth. Apart from mountains and volcanoes, Io's surface appears to be very smooth, with only a few meteorite impact craters on it. Another amazing characteristic of Io is the dunes, ribbon-like formations that are visible near the volcano Prometheus. It is believed that the hot lava erupting from volcanoes comes into contact with patches of frozen sulfur dioxide and causes it to release heat as a gas. It then expands violently, creating a temporary wind on the surface, enough to throw grains in the form of sand and create dunes. The space probe Juno made the first of nine flights to Io that are planned for the next two years. During two of these flybys, the device will be able to fly to a very close distance from this satellite of Jupiter, about 1,500 kilometers. The spacecraft will make these two close flybys of Io on December 30, 2023 and February 3, 2024. At that time, Juno will study how volcanic eruptions interact with Jupiter's powerful magnetic field and influence the occurrence of polar aurora borealises. Io is arguably one of the most captivating and extraordinary moons of which we know. In addition to being the fourth largest moon in the solar system, it is also the densest of those known. Its bright, multicolored surface is the most volcanically active in the solar system.
There are seas, mountains, dunes, although not from sand, but from heat-resistant organic matter. And when summer comes to the North Pole, it even rains methane. It's an amazing world. Indeed, we are talking about Titan, Saturn's biggest moon, the second largest moon in the solar system, after Jupiter's satellite Ganymede. It is the only celestial body in the solar system, with the exception of Earth and Mars, for which the existence of liquid on the surface has been proven, and it's the only moon on the planet with a dense atmosphere. The diameter of Titan is 5,152 kilometers, which is 50% larger than that of the moon, while Titan is 80% larger in mass than Earth's satellite. Titan also surpasses the planet Mercury in size, although it is smaller than it in mass. The force of gravity on it is approximately one-seventh that of the Earth's. Titan's mass makes up 95% of the mass of all of Saturn's moons. Titan conceals many of its secrets, but today we will turn our attention to its amazing landscape. Now the surface of Titan is composed mainly of water ice and sedimentary organic matter. It is geologically young and mostly flat, with the exception of a small number of mountainous formations and craters, as well as a few cryovolcanoes. For a long time, the dense atmosphere surrounding Titan made it impossible for the surface of the Moon to be seen until the arrival of the Cassini-Huygens space research mission. Scientists suspect that under the ice shell of Titan, at a depth of about a hundred kilometers, there is an ocean of liquid water. This is indicated by some irregularities in the oscillations of the Moon in its orbital motion. Photographed by the Cassini in various spectral ranges, the surface of Titan in the tropical latitudes is divided into several bright and dark regions with clear boundaries. Near the equator, on the leading hemisphere, there is a bright region the size of Australia, which is high ground, probably a mountainous area. It was named Xenadu. In general, the surface topography of Titan is relatively level. The variation in height is no more than two kilometers. However, local changes of elevation, as shown by radar data and stereoscopic images obtained by the Huygens, can be quite significant. Steep slopes on Titan are not uncommon. This is the result of intense erosion in conjunction with wind and liquid. There are several objects that look like impact craters, presumably filled with hydrocarbons. Many craters may have been buried under a layer of sediment or were quickly smoothed over by intense wind erosion. The surface of Titan in the temperature latitudes is less contrasting. Titan has distinct indications of volcanic activity. However, despite the similarity in the form and characteristics of the volcanoes, it is not silicate-based volcanoes that are at play on the satellite, as on the Earth or Mars and Venus, but what are known as cryovolcanoes, which most likely erupt with a water-ammonia mixture with a touch of hydrocarbons. Unlike the Earth, in the course of the change of seasons, powerful clouds of Titan move a great deal more along the latitudes, while on Earth they move north or south only slightly. Disappearing islands on Titan have also been a huge mystery for years. The largest of them is in the mysterious seas of Kraken Mare. The depth of the seas ranges to several hundred meters. Studies of the sea, Ligia Mare, have discovered an unusual feature. Bright island-like objects that appear and disappear in some radar images. Moreover, there aren't any significant waves on these bodies of water. There are two explanations of what they can be, gas bubbles or solid floating formations. It turned out that at the surface the mixture exists in the form of one phase, but at a depth of 130 to 170 meters, the ternary mixture's state changes into a combination of two liquid phases and one gaseous. The solubility of nitrogen in ethene is much lower than in methane. It is emitted as a gas. Chemists estimate the diameter of the average bubble at 4.6 centimeters. 
This size is apparently enough for them to be visible to the radar. Nevertheless, researchers would like to note that there is not enough data to give an accurate description of the processes occurring in the seas of Titan. For example, the temperature and exact composition of the seas are unknown. More accurate data may be provided by future missions to the Moon. A new target of research is Saturn's moon Titan, to which the Dragonfly mission will be launched in 2026. It's expected that in 2034 the eight-rotor drone will land on Titan, which will receive electrical power by means of a thermoelectric generator. Becoming an eyewitness to these new discoveries will truly be an exciting and amazing time. properties of light 
and its impact on our lives never cease to amaze us. Light, or electromagnetic wave, plays a central role in many aspects of our lives and is a key concept in physics. Fundamental questions such as the interaction of light with matter, the propagation of light waves and the transfer of energy have been the basis for many important discoveries and theories of physics. But if light is a type of electromagnetic radiation that is usually associated with the visible part of the spectrum, what can be said about a concept like darkness? More precisely, the concept is there. But is the phenomenon itself there? Even if you turn off the sun, the Earth will not plunge into total darkness. Light from stars, nebulae, and even the Big Bang itself will illuminate your sky in this case. The planet itself and everything on it, including our bodies, also emit light and it will be visible in the infrared. Even if you somehow found a way to turn off the sun, even then it will emit a certain level of light almost forever. There's enough for our age and for many centuries to come. But of course it will be eerie to realize the eternal cold. So as long as we can see, we'll see. No optical sensor can detect total darkness or take black holes the darkest of the supposed objects. Even they are capable of emitting some percentage of light, according to some theories. In physics, unlike in the realm of interpersonal relationships, light always defeats darkness. Electromagnetic waves are a collection of alternating electric and magnetic fields that propagate through space at a specific frequency and wavelength. The spectrum of electromagnetic radiation includes in addition to visible light, radio waves, microwaves, infrared, ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. Yes, light plays an important role in physics because of its ability to interact with matter and change its properties. When light particles, photons, are absorbed, atoms and molecules move to higher energy levels, which can cause chemical reactions, thermal radiation, changes in the state of matter, and even nuclear reactions. Where does light itself come from? Let's take the example of the emission of light by the sun. In our star, numerous chemical and thermonuclear reactions take place, which are accompanied by the emission of quanta of light. When two hydrogen atoms collide, they combine to form one atom, called deuterium, which is lighter than the atoms from which it was formed and the extra energy is released as a photon. Deuterium, in turn, joins one more hydrogen atom, and helium. Three is formed, and one more photon is released. When two helium, three atoms collide, helium, three atoms collide, helium. Four, two hydrogen atoms, and one more photon are formed. So, the sun from four hydrogen atoms produces one helium atom and three photons, and that's just from one chain of reactions. Each of these photons carries a large amount of energy and for tens of thousands and millions of years, wanders inside the sun, colliding with atoms, heating up the sun, and turning into dozens of photons with less energy and frequency visible to the eye. Sooner or later, these photons fly out of the sun and go on a long and sad journey through space. And some of them come to Earth, giving us light and warmth. So what are the physical characteristics of light? First, it is speed. One of the most important fundamental constants in physics. In a vacuum, it is equal to almost 300,000 kilometers per second. What about the speed of darkness? How fast will the eerie darkness descend upon us? The simplest answer is that the speed of darkness is the same as the speed of light. Turn off the sun and our sky will be dark eight minutes from now. What we used to call the speed of light is the speed of propagation, and it is not always the deciding factor. The shadow that falls across the landscape is cast by objects, and the feature of those objects and the distance from them 
will determine how fast it falls. For example, a rotating lighthouse searchlight illuminates the surroundings at regular intervals. However, the relative rate of dimming of the surroundings increases with increasing distance from the lighthouse itself. If you move far enough away from the lighthouse, the shadow will catch up with you faster than the speed of light propagation. Isn't that right? The same thing happens with neutron stars in space, for example. In other words, in this case, the speed of light will only mean a delay. Even if the beacon is pointed directly at you, you will see the light. Not immediately, but with some delay. However, this will have no effect on the course of events that you will see when you are in your position. In any case, you have been detected and have nowhere to run to. Moreover, light has an inherent wavelength. The spectrum of visible light is just the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that the human eye can see. The cone-shaped cells in our eyes act as receivers tuned to wavelengths in this narrow band of the spectrum. Other parts of the spectrum have wavelengths that are too large or too small and energetic for us to see. When objects get hotter, they emit energy, dominated by shorter wavelengths, changing color before our eyes. The flame of a blowtorch changes color from reddish to bluish as it is set to burn hotter. In the same way, the color of stars tells us their temperature. Our sun emits more yellow light than any other because its surface temperature is 5,000, 500 and deek. If the sun's surface were colder, say 3,000 dex, it would look reddish, like the star Betelgeuse. If the sun were hotter, around 12,000 dec, it would look blue, like the star Rigel. Reflection, refraction, and absorption of light are the basic processes that occur when light interacts with matter. Let's break each of them down a bit. Reflection is the process by which light reflected from objects hits the smooth surface of a mirror and is then reflected back, giving us an image of the object. That is, the angle of incidence of light is equal to the angle of reflection. Further, refraction of light is a phenomenon in which light rays change their direction of travel when passing from one medium to another with different densities. This causes objects in water to appear displaced or distorted compared to their position in the air. This is why faces in water are so creepy. Finally, Absorption is the process by which light hitting the surface of an object is converted into another form of energy, such as heat. This occurs due to the interaction of light waves with material particles. For example, when an object is illuminated with blue light, the object may absorb all the blue waves and reflect red and green waves. As a result, the object will appear greenish, red, will appear greenish, red. This explains why objects have certain colors. They absorb some light waves and reflect others, and is not the work of sorcerers. So, the interaction of these three processes determines how we perceive light and see objects in the world around us. Reflection and refraction form the images of the objects we see, while absorption determines their color and brightness. Unlike light, darkness is not a physical category, but rather a relative state. It's not even that. It is a subjective perception of the state. Photons may or may not be reflected. Retinal cells may trigger memory processes, but cannot explain the subjective experience of darkness. Just as waves cannot be represented by anything more than our experience of color, or sound. Our subjective experience changes from time to time, but the individual parts of that experience lie outside of time. And in this sense, we can say that darkness itself has no speed. What is speed in the common understanding? And does it exist at all? It presupposes in advance the existence of some space in which it can be measured. However, in the world of quantum physics, 
where the familiar concepts of conventional physics often become useless. It is believed that space itself is one of the derivatives of a more fundamental level of reality, where there are no such concepts as position, distance, or speed at all. In conclusion, let us try to draw some conclusions and clarify how important and inseparable all the properties of light are. We already know the basic characteristics of light. It is a form of electromagnetic radiation, consisting of photons, and has the ability to propagate in a vacuum at a constant speed. At the same time, light is often described in terms of its dual nature, having the properties of both waves and particles. This unusual property is not only striking and surprising, but is also an important key to understanding fundamental mechanisms in quantum mechanics, as well as phenomena such as interference, diffraction, and polarization in light. Light also plays an invaluable role, not only on our planet, but in the universe as a whole. Its ability to deliver information from the farthest reaches of space, to create conditions for life on Earth, and to serve as a tool for studying and understanding the world around us, makes light a true magical phenomenon. We owe it to light for the ability to see and perceive our surroundings. It allows us to admire the beauties of nature, distinguish colors and shapes, and facilitates our social interaction and communication. Thus, whatever light is by nature, it is one of the most amazing phenomena ever discovered by mankind. But the question of how light originally came to be remains open. The largest satellite of Saturn and the second largest satellite in the solar system, after Ganymede, is Titan. Over the decades, we've been learning more and more about this satellite, and they are constantly replenished. So what do we know about Titan? About this world, more than a billion kilometers away from us, is life in one form or another. Really possible there? Let's try to find answers to these and many other questions. So, Titan is a cold, icy world with a surface temperature of minus 170 degrees Celsius, hidden by an orange, hazy atmosphere. Titan has a radius of about 2,500 kilometers and is more than one million kilometers away from Saturn. It takes about 80 minutes for light from the sun to reach Titan making sunlight there about 100 times fainter than on Earth, which tells us not at all a resort destination. In 15 days and 22 hours, Titan makes a complete revolution around Saturn and is also in synchronous rotation with its planet, meaning it always faces the same side of the planet. Since Titan rotates roughly along Saturn's equatorial plane, the seasons there last more than seven Earth years, and a year equals 29 Earth years. Titan's internal structure is not fully known, but one model based on data from the Cassini mission suggests that Titan has several layers. The innermost layer is a core of silicate rock about 3,000 kilometers in diameter. The core 
is surrounded by a shell of a special type of water ice, which is only found at extremely high pressure. This high pressure ice is then surrounded by a layer of salty liquid water, on top of which is an outer crust of water ice. The surface is covered with organic molecules that have come in with rain or otherwise deposited from the atmosphere in the form of sand and liquids. The atmospheric pressure on Titan is about 60 higher than on Earth. To feel it, you have to go down to a depth of about 15 meters into the ocean. That's how you will feel on Titan. So it's not very comfortable. This is true because the satellite is less massive than the Earth. Its gravity does not hold the gas shell so strongly. So the atmosphere extends to a height 10 times higher than the Earth's, almost 600 kilometers into space. Titan's dense atmosphere is mostly composed of nitrogen, about 95, and methane, about 5, with small amounts of other carbon-rich compounds. High in Titan's atmosphere, methane and nitrogen molecules are split by solar ultraviolet and high. Energy particles accelerated in Saturn's magnetic field. Parts of these molecules recombine to form various organic chemicals containing carbon and hydrogen, as well as nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen, and other elements important to life on Earth, which is a very curious metamorphosis. Some compounds formed when methane and nitrogen are broken down and recycled create a kind of smog, a thick orange haze that makes Titan's surface hard to see from space. Some of the heavy, carbon-rich compounds settle to the surface forming a kind of sand on Titan's vast dunes. And methane condenses into clouds that sometimes flood the surface with methane rain. The only mystery for researchers so far is where does the methane itself come from? Since sunlight is constantly destroying it in Titan's atmosphere, there must be some source of replenishment. It is highly likely that the methane could have been spewed into the atmosphere by volcanoes ejecting cooled water instead of molten rock lava. During the Cassini probe mission near Titan, it was possible to obtain images that recorded emissions of a cold substance, presumably liquid methane, into the satellite's atmosphere. At the same time was discovered Mount Doom, the highest mountain on the satellite a height of 1,600 meters, which in all likelihood has a cryovolcanic origin. Two light formations of temporary nature were also discovered, which are the result of the activation of cryovolcanoes that spewed water, ammonia mixture with hydrocarbon admixture. The thickness of ice flows on Titan, reaches 200 meters, which is possible due to the high viscosity of cryomagma, comparable to the viscosity of basaltic lava on Earth. But the amazing thing is that in just a few years, huge areas of the landscape shifted during this time by about 30 kilometers. Since Titan is always turned to Saturn on one side, this shift can be explained by the fact that the icy surface is separated from the main mass of the satellite by a liquid layer, an underground liquid ocean, which is most likely associated with the activity of cryovolcanoes on Titan. And one of the sources of energy is most likely a powerful tidal influence of Saturn on its satellite. As for the underground ocean, it is assumed that the water contains a significant amount of ammonia, about 10 which acts as an antifreeze for water and keeps it from freezing. Based on the gravity map of the satellite, it was concluded that the liquid in the subsurface ocean of Titan is characterized by increased density and very high salinity, which includes salts containing sodium, potassium, and sulfur. In addition, the depth of the ocean varies in different areas of the satellite, and yes, Hypothetically, there could be something living in ammonia. It's a kind of alternative biochemistry, which explains the possibility of life forms partially or completely different from Earth's. Differences include replacing carbon in organic molecules with other atoms, or replacing water as the universal solvent with other liquids. So don't be surprised if we find a hypertrophied snail with a titanium shell.
There are clouds on Titan, but they are quite small. They can cover no more than ones of the surface, although this value sometimes reaches eight. In addition, a huge cloud was recorded at an altitude of 40 kilometers above the North Pole of Titan. This formation consisted most likely of ethane, because only ethane is able to condense at this height. Clouds made of a mixture of methane and organic compounds were also recorded. It is believed that such clouds can make methane, ethane rain or snow, depending on the temperature. Yes, Titan is harsh in any season. Titan's surface is one of the most Earth, like places in the solar system, albeit with much lower temperatures and a different chemical composition. It's so cold here that rocks form from water ice, like icicles, but licking them is strongly discouraged. Titan's surface is divided into several light and dark areas with clear boundaries. In the area of the equator, there is a famous light region the size of Australia called Xanadu. Also, in the equatorial regions, there are vast areas of dark dunes consisting of hydrocarbon grains, which can resemble coffee grounds mixed with icy sand. Cat scratches is the name given to long parallel rows of dunes stretching for hundreds of kilometers in the direction of prevailing winds west to east. Images show that Titan's ice dunes are huge, reaching on average up to three kilometers wide, hundreds of kilometers wide, hundreds of kilometers long, and about 100 meters high, a great place for giant worms to stay. Dust storms are frequent, and the different seasons on Titan can affect dramatic changes in the speed of the local winds. It is currently believed that the fastest winds on Titan blow near the equator, the exact speed of which has not been determined. But presumably, for only 30 Earth hours around the entire satellite. During this time, they carry streams of warm air from lower latitudes to the poles of Titan. Perhaps the results of further research will help to find out what really happens on Titan and what weather conditions are formed there during different seasons. Titan has few visible impact craters, meaning its surface must be relatively young and some combination of processes erases impact marks over time. Just as on Earth, craters are erased by the relentless forces of fluid flow, wind, and plate tectonics. These forces are present on Titan in slightly modified forms, according to data and computer calculations. The seas on Titan are mostly composed of ethane and methane. There may also be propane and small amounts of hydrogen cyanide, but nay, also be propane and, and acetylene. You know, opening a chemical factory would be no problem. Animations from the photos show periodic changes in the coastline, which is attributed more to the waves. As for the potential for life on Titan, it is probably there rather than completely absent. We know for sure that Titan hides an ocean of liquid water mixed with salts and ammonia beneath its surface and this discovery of a global ocean of liquid water adds Titan to the handful of worlds in our solar system that could potentially contain a habitable environment. Yes, it's not suitable for life as we know it. But do we know everything? In addition, rivers, lakes, and seas of liquid methane and ethane could also serve as habitable environments on the surface, though any life there would be very different from life on Earth. Despite the fact that over the years, we have learned quite a lot about this amazing satellite. But having received new knowledge, more questions were born. The variety of features of Titan's surface is surprising and fascinating. Many people compare it to the Earth. Indeed, its similarity in the form of relief, the presence of seas, rivers, dunes, its atmosphere, which protects from radiation, finds common features with our planet. It is at the same time a world very similar and completely different from our Earth, a unique place in the solar system that requires further study.
during transit, some of the star's light passes through the exoplanet's atmospheres, transformed by the atmosphere's chemical composition. This has given astronomers the opportunity to remotely study the climate of terrestrial worlds outside the solar system. And this is important because TRAPPIST-1 worlds are the most optimal worlds available to us today. They provide the first opportunities for humanity to detect signs of biology beyond the solar system. During transit, some of the star's light passes through the exoplanet's atmospheres, transformed by the atmosphere's chemical composition. This has given astronomers the opportunity to remotely study the climate of terrestrial worlds outside the solar system. And this is important because TRAPPIST-1 worlds are the most optimal worlds available to us today. They provide the first opportunities for humanity to detect signs of biology beyond the solar system. Their initial discovery was made with a small telescope. A little later, exoplanets were discovered with the Trappist Spitzer and full telescopes. Thanks to the transit signals, it was possible to measure orbital periods and calculate their sizes. The exact transit times of exoplanets also makes it possible to measure their masses, which made it possible to know the density and therefore the properties of the bulk. Astronomers have found that exoplanets conform to a rocky composition and that their sizes and masses are comparable to those of Earth and Venus. Relying on data from the distance of exoplanets to their star and the temperature of the star itself, the researchers were able to conclude that some of them receive the same amount of light as many of the planets in the solar system. From Mercury to Mars, the James Webb Space Telescope has taken its first look at a long-awaited target. The atmospheres of seven Earth-sized planets orbiting the star TRAPPIST, one just 39 light-years from Earth. All seven planets are in or near the habitable zone of their star and could have liquid water in one form or another. For astronomers, this is perhaps the best known laboratory for studying planets outside the solar system for their suitability for life. Finally, the James Webb Telescope has set its eyes on these distant worlds. At the outset, it is worth noting that the telescope has confirmed that of the seven known exoplanets in the TRAPPIST, one system, three are in the habitable zone. Planets D, E, and F are the third, fourth, and fifth exoplanets. According to the measured density, TRAPPIST, Oneb, the first from the star, may either have a small nucleus or, more likely, contain a significant fraction of water or other volatiles in its composition. In view of the too high surface temperatures of the first two exoplanets, the maintenance of water in liquid form there is highly unlikely. The fifth exoplanet, F, has a fairly low density and maybe an ocean planet with space tangents in its interior. By the way, to date, it is believed that the habitable zone may be wider. If we consider volcanic hydrogen as a potential greenhouse gas, contributing to the increase in climatic temperature, the telescope also saw some similarities with Centauri Proxima. Namely, that the X-ray emission of TRAPPIST. One system approximately corresponds to the X-ray emission of Proxima Centauri and the ultraviolet radiation produced by hydrogen atoms from the chromospheric layer of the star is already six times less than on Centauri. For this reason, the two closest exoplanets to the star, TRAPPIST, Oneb and TRAPPIST, Wonek, could have lost their atmospheres and hydrospheres and hydrospheres in a time span of two to three billion years if their initial masses were similar to Earth's. However, replenishment of atmospheric hydrogen and oxygen may occur through a reaction in which molecules of chemical compounds are broken down by photons if the planets contain a lot of water in one form or another in their composition. Currently, the James Webb Telescope has studied the exoplanet TRAPPIST, Oneb, in more detail, where signs of a high-density atmosphere of the closest planet to the star are not detected or optically thin. 
Further observations showed that this exoplanet receives four times more radiation than Earth from the sun and is in tidal capture. The temperature of the day side of the planet was estimated with a maximum of 260 degrees Celsius, according to telescope data. And most likely, the heat is not being distributed from the day side to the night side to the night side. Also in the new study, there's already data from a second rocky exoplanet, Trappist, Warneck, which is also in a tidal lock. The planet is interesting because it could be, in fact, a twin of Venus, since it's about the same size and receives the same amount of radiation from its star, but still not as harsh because it has a daytime temperature of about 106 degrees Celsius versus Venus's 420 degrees. And yet, it still gives you an aggressive tan. Although these first measurements do not provide definitive information about the nature of Trappist, Wunek, they help narrow down the range of possibilities. The results are consistent with the exoplanet being essentially a rock consisting of caves and rocks with no atmosphere and no living aliens, but still not as harsh because it has a daytime temperature of about 106 degrees Celsius versus Venus's 420 degrees. And yet, it still gives you an aggressive tan. Although these first measurements do not provide definitive information about the nature of Trappist, Wunek, they help narrow down the range of possibilities. The results are consistent with the exoplanet being essentially a rock consisting of caves and rocks with no atmosphere and no living aliens. The James Webb Telescope is currently studying galactic nebulae and black holes, but it also has another important goal. The star system LP791-18 is 89 light years away in the constellation Cratera and has at least two planets. The system was originally found by ground and space telescopes Tess and Spitzer. By observing the orbit of the Earth-sized planet, it was found that the surface has volcanic activity, which could lead to the existence of an atmosphere, thanks to which water can condense. Moreover, the planet is on the inner edge of the habitable zone, which is neither too hot nor too cold for water in liquid form to exist, not only in the atmosphere, but also on the surface. In the same star system, there is another planet, ELP 791, 18, a more massive and larger gas giant, which in turn exerts a significant gravitational force on the Earth, like planet. The gravitational force also slightly deforms both the planet itself and its inhabitants, because of which it is observed high volcanic activity. Similar processes occur on one of the moons of Jupiter, Researchers have already received approval to study the atmosphere of LP-791, 18 with the James Webb Telescope, thanks to which it will be possible to learn more about the planet. The James Webb Space Telescope is now practically the world's premier space observatory, allowing us to peer into distant worlds around other stars, explore mysterious structures, and learn more about the origins of the universe and our place in it. So far, Nearly 6,000 exoplanets in 4,000 star systems have already been confirmed, with several thousand more candidates awaiting verification. Of course, the public's attention is focused on planets that are as Earth-like as possible. We have not given up hope of finding intelligent life in space. However, the bulk of distant worlds look very strange to us. There are often conditions there that we can't even imagine, after all. Science fiction writers have long advised people not to fixate on our carbon-based form of life. There may be much in the universe beyond our understanding, but science exists to push those boundaries.
The Milky Way is a relatively medium-sized galaxy, which has nevertheless been able to provide a home to about one billion planets. Each of these worlds possesses its own unique features and characteristics that are sometimes radically different from those we are used to seeing on Earth. One of these unusual worlds could be a rocky planet that orbits four stars at once in the same system. Between one and a half and two astronomical units from the center of the system meet HD 98800. It is a multiple system of four stars located in the constellation crater approximately 150 light years from us. What can such a world signify? What kind of phenomena can occur on this planet? A bit later, we will definitely be imaginatively transported to this extraordinary world. Yes, in space there are more complex star systems with two, or even more rarely, three stars, which spin around each other in complex orbits. However, this new discovery is proof that this is not the limit. A group of astronomers were able to detect a system in the universe with four stars. Amazingly, all this time it was hiding a mere 146 light years from us. Instances of systems that consist of four stars are incredibly rare. However, the uniqueness of this object is further enhanced by the fact that HD 98800b has a protoplanetary disk. Using the Spitzer Space Telescope, Astronomers discovered that it is composed of two belts. The outer belt is separated from the center of a double star by 5.9 astronomical units, almost the same distance separating Jupiter from the Sun. Researchers suspect that this belt is made up of comets and asteroids. The inner belt is located at a distance of two astronomical units from the center as Mars is from the Sun and it looks like it is formed of fine dust. This kind of division of the protoplanetary disk into sections usually occurs during the formation of a planet but in this case it came about most likely for another reason. Under the influence of the gravity of neighboring mate HD 98800A. How is it possible? The fact is that in most systems it is aligned in respect to the main star. For example, in a solar system all the planets and most of the asteroids spin approximately on the same plane with the Sun. But this does not apply to HD 98800. It has a disk of gas and dust that is positioned at a right angle to the central stars. This is the first system that is known to us with a perpendicular disk and such an anomaly promises many more astonishing discoveries. Presumably, if astronomers manage to find other similar older systems, it will be possible to observe planets spinning in strange orbits at all sorts of angles. In turn, this might lead to the formation of new types of planets still unknown to science. However, another scenario is also possible. In such conditions, planets simply cannot form from a protoplanetary disk. The search remains to be continued. In space, there are still many curiosities unknown to mankind. On the other hand, we now understand that planetary formation can, at the very least, begin in these polar circumbinary disks. If the remaining portion of a planet's formation process can occur, there may be an entire population of displaced near-Earth planets that we have yet to discover with such things as odd seasonal variations. But although planetary formation may begin, it is unclear to what extent planets can form and remain stable in such a seemingly chaotic system. However, if planets were to exist, the view from one of them in a system like this would be amazing. A hypothetical observer would see a bright streak rising from the horizon across the entire sky. 